have a seat? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. And I'm going to go ahead and invite you to um, get your attention on the screen as we do our announcements. We're glad to have you here with us. We would also like to thank those of you who have joined us online. We would like to welcome our first time guests. We're so happy you're here. Please fill out a connect card. Raise your hand if you need one and one of our greeters will be happy to hand you one. Or scan our QR code on the screen to fill it out from your smartphone. Don't forget to download the Church Center app to keep up to date with upcoming events, giving, and being a part of small groups. Join us for our pre-service prayer before every service from 6 to 6.30 p.m. in our sanctuary. We encourage everyone to join our early morning prayer from 5.30 to 6 a.m. We have a time of soaking. From 6 to 6.30 a.m. we pray on behalf of our city, church, and family. To participate, join the early morning prayer small group on the Church Center app to get the Zoom link. Let's agree together in prayer. And kids ministry. Sign up sheet is in the back or see Veronica Costa. Sundays, 5 to 6 30 p.m., we have our women's, men's, and kids ministries. Women's ministry, Hearts on Fire with Ana Chavez. Men's ministry, Kingdom Men with Robert Acosta Sr. And our kids ministry, Cadet Edition with Catalina Campos. Come grow with us. We have a young women's group, Girl Time, ages 16 to 35, for a time to hang out, fellowship, and study the women in the Bible. Once a month, see Emily Picochel for more details. Mark your calendars, we will be having a guest speaker, Pastor Aaron Anderson, on Thursday and Friday, May 18 to 19, at 7 p.m. Make sure to be here and invite others. Thursday and Friday, June 1st and 2nd, at 7 p.m., Bishop Robert Hooks will be with us. You won't want to miss. We're excited to announce our next prophetic conference, Thursday, September 7th through Saturday, September 9th. Be sure to mark your calendars. More information to come. Can you sing? Can you play an instrument? Would you like to try out for our worship team? If so, see Nancy Acosta for more information. Do you have a desire to learn and worship God with a tambourine? Would you like to join our Unity Tambourine Group? Speak with Gloria Camirano for more information. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. <coughs> Hallelujah. So we do have some guests today. <laughs> and if you don't know, what we're doing is um, for every guest that comes in, we give them a $10 um, Starbucks um, gift card so that you can enjoy Starbucks on on the Citadel. We're so glad that you're here. So if I um, I just want to welcome Edwin and Ashley Murieta. Catania is going to be giving you um, the gift card. Also, um, is it Rosalind and Nick? Amos, welcome to what you're here. And Kathy Hyde, welcome to what you're here. Thank you everybody for coming. Just a few, if you're here, um, invite a guest um, with you. And at, at the end of the month, whoever invited the most guests is going to receive a gift basket. So you don't want to miss out. Please invite, invite, invite. And as you heard, tomorrow we're having service again here at 7. So please invite your friends, your family, your neighbors, your co-workers, anybody and everybody. They'll come and be blessed. I'm telling you. There's going to be a powerful word uh, being spoken. <laughs> so now's the time uh, for our tithes and offering. I want to read out of Deuteronomy 9.18. Excuse me, 18 out of the NIV translation. It says, then once again, hold on. That's, wait, that's the wrong one. It was Deuteronomy 8, 18. 
And it says, but remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. And so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your ancestors as it is today. And we just want to encourage you to give up your tithes and offering because wealth comes from the Lord. No matter what you're doing, no matter what's happening in your life, um, your wealth doesn't come from your job. You see, God, God provides your job for you. And it doesn't come from your boss. It doesn't come... All of that comes from God. All good things come from the Lord. So when you give up your tithes and offering, it's a heart issue. It's saying, God, I believe you. I trust in you. Here's my 10% or whatever he puts on your heart to give. And I'm going to see you move. You see, we have to get ourselves into a position where we can allow God to move and to do something in our lives. So many of us get caught up with what's going on in our families or in, in, our, in our own life and finances that we hold on and we say, no, we need this. I need this. I can't give this to the Lord. Lord, I can't pay you a tithe on this paycheck. But you know what? I'm, I'm challenging you. And even the word says to, to, test, to test God in this. That you give of your tithes and offering, that you'll see him open the windows of heaven and pour upon you such a great blessing that you will not have room enough to contain. And I've seen him over and over and over again to be faithful because he's not a man that he should lie. You see, so Robert and I have been in situations where, you know what, We're, we either pay a bill or we pay our offering. What are we going to do? So what I know, what we've done now is we pay our offerings first and we say, God, this is yours. I don't, we would, it's yours. We're just going to give it to you. And then we pay our bills. And if we don't have enough, we're like, okay, God, you know our situation. You know what's happening. So we just place it in your hands and we thank you that you're going to take care of it. And I'm going to tell you time and time and time again, the Lord has been faithful to supply that need. We have never been in want. Even, I'm telling you, even if it's at that minute, that second, that day, God supplies. And I just want to encourage you to give, give, you know, the Bible says, prove him now. So give and tell him, okay, God, she said, the Bible said, prove you now. It's in Malachi. You can read it. And see him move. See him supply to the full your every need. And that is not only, that does not, it doesn't only cover your finances. If you need a healing, if you need um, God to move on your children, if you need a job, if whatever you need. God, everything comes from God. God is our provider. Our provision comes from him. Everything comes from him. So we just look to him and say, okay, God, this is what I need. I'm putting it before you, and I'm trusting you. Yes. And watch him. You know, a lot of people have trust issues. But let me tell you, if you begin to step out and say, okay, God, I'm letting go, and I'm going to watch you move and watch you move. So tonight, we're just going to encourage you to please give. Um, you can give by um, online at the www.thecitadel.church. You can give a, talk, a text a dollar amount to 84321, or you can do the church center app. You can give there as well. That's the easiest, that's what I do. Uh, or you can give by cash or check. Um, our ushers, if you are needing an envelope and you want to get a tax write-off at the end of the year, um, please raise your hand. You'll get an envelope, one of our ushers will give you that. And what I want to ask you is just raise up your hand with that offering. Yes. Because you know what? We're just going to say, Lord, yes. here we are, Father. Mother, I just thank you tonight, Father God, that you are Jehovah Jireh. You are the one who sees our needs and provides for them, Lord God. And Father God, tonight, Father God, we are giving of our tithes and our offerings, Lord God, to further your cause, your kingdom, Father. Thanking you, Lord God, that you will open unto us the windows of heaven, that you will pour upon us so much that we will have not, no room to contain, Father God, that we will be over in abundance, Lord God, overflowing, Lord God, so that we can even help others in need, Father God. I thank you, Lord God, that your word says that you will rebuke the devour for our, from our lives for our sake, Lord God, and we give you the glory and the honor for what you're doing, Lord, that you are making a way where there seems to be no way, Lord God, that you are opening doors which no one is able to open, and you are closing those doors which no one is able to close, Lord God. I thank you, Father God, that, Lord, that there will be so much breakthrough in our lives, Lord God, that no matter what we are in need of, Lord God, that you will supply, Lord God. We thank you, Father, we praise you, and we adore you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So Robert's going to walk around.
to collect our, our tithes and our offerings. And just to give you a heads up, after um, the powerful message that's coming, we're going to take another offering to uh, bless our speaker. Um, he's coming from Antioch, California. Um, we've heard him preach before. Let me tell you, get ready, get ready, get ready. God has a word for you. And even if you look around, you know what? God has a word for each one of you tonight. You're not here by accident. And I know that there might not be many, but let me tell you, you're here for a reason. So just open up your hearts, open up your ears, and just get rid of all um, distractions. And just pay attention to what the Holy Spirit has for you tonight. I want to go ahead and dismiss our children. You're dismissed to go with, with Adelina. Have fun. We love you. God bless you. And I want to introduce Pastor Aaron Anderson. Amen. All right, all right. As all the kids dismiss, we're going to have a little bit of fun in here tonight. Try not to hold you past uh, 11 o'clock tonight, so you can be sure to come back tomorrow. Well, my name is Aaron Anderson. Thank you so much for the introduction. It's a privilege and an honor to be here. I uh, want to honor Prophet John and Miliana Harkey for... Um, all that they do um, really around the world and um, definitely what they do here. Uh, they've been a very large influence in my wife and I's life and thankful for their ministry, thankful for this church and thankful for what God's doing. Um, there's a, there's a, a swift uh, revival coming to Tucson and to this yeah. church. And so I'm excited that I get to, uh, to be a part of what God is doing. Um, how many were here last time I was here? Was that all of us. We've got a couple of new ones in the house. Amen. Well, I'm a little crazy. Um, crazier than most, I think. That's why they sent me to California. And uh, that's where all the crazy people go. Um, and so we are pastoring a church in Antioch, California, which is just outside of San Francisco. And um, uh, my wife and I uh, have been married coming up on 25 years of marriage, uh, four kids uh, ranging from 24 to eight. Wow. Yeah, that's what I said. Wow. <laughs> and um, so we have a 24, a 21 and an 18 year old. And then we have an eight year old. And so uh, that was God telling me to stay humble and to stay young. Hallelujah. <laughs> and so uh, thankful for. Thankful for my family. My wife is um, getting ready tomorrow to do a women's encounter for our church. And uh, otherwise she would have been here, but they are they are going strong. And, um, you know, just, uh, are we online? Yes. All right, well, just our little secret and whoever's online. I'm kind of thankful that I'm here, so I don't have to uh, do all that stuff there. Hallelujah. I'm just kidding. Um, all things, all things are going well in Antioch. Just a report, the church, last time I was here, uh, reporting all the things that God was doing in our church and um, uh, doing so many things in um, the lives of people in our church. Our church has grown dramatically um, over the course of the, uh, you know, my wife and I were born and raised in Southern California and uh, we left in 2007 to go uh, pastor in uh, Cape Girardeau, Missouri, to come on staff with a church there. Um, and it, it was a great honor to be there for uh, almost 13 years and um, got really uh, mentored and and, um, and shaped and molded into the things that God had for us. And um, it's actually where I met Prophet John Harkey. Um, we had a prophetic conference and he would come with a panel of other prophets and uh, we get to hang out and uh, I thought I thought that he was um, one of the most I still do think that he's one of the most accurate prophets yeah. that are out there today and yeah. so uh, there are a lot of self-proclaimed prophets but you know the ones that prophesy with the Holy Ghost is the ones that you can have discernment on to know that that's the real deal uh, everybody can prophesy but not everybody's a prophet yeah. and so um, understanding that is very important but um, God called us back to California, not by choice. We argued with him for many, many months that he was wrong. 
And uh, it's kind of hard to argue with God that he's wrong. And uh, we did not want to go back to California. Uh, when we left, uh, we didn't want to leave. But once we left, I said, I'm never coming back. And uh, we came back and uh, we've been in Antioch, California for about three and a half years. Um, took a church um, about the size of this one, maybe about, uh, you know, 15 or 20 people that were consistent with some visitors here and there. And uh, now uh, running hundreds of people. Uh, we just uh, switched over a couple of months ago. Uh, we were so packed out. We couldn't fit any more people. We couldn't park any more cars. We had people parking up and down the streets and all over the place. And uh, our sanctuary holds about 300 people. And uh, we couldn't fit any more people in. So now we're in multiple services. We do a, a 9, 11, and a 6 o'clock service on Sunday to try to get everybody in. And God is doing great things. And so thankful that um, uh, consistency is what brings breakthrough. Yes, it's when you continue to do what God's called you to do and don't quit. God is testing your faithfulness and he's doing that here. And uh, we'll uh, we'll prophesy over the house here in, in just a little bit. But tonight, I believe that God's given me a specific word. Now, I was trying to remember what I preached on last time I was here and I, I can't remember. So anybody else remember? Okay, good. If I preach the same thing, you all be like, "Wow, that was new." You know, I, I know that I, I I know a little bit about what I preach, but uh, I I feel like this was a word that I was supposed to to preach here. It came it came to me about three weeks ago as I was preparing, and um, I'm going to have you turn in your Bibles to Second Kings, Second um, Kings chapter two, and I'm going to set the story up a little bit. The goal tonight. Um, if there is a goal, is to follow the leading of the Holy Ghost. Um, but the ultimate, uh, as the leading of the Holy Ghost, uh, as we follow him, uh, what I believe the Lord is showing me is that there is some of us here, maybe all of us here, that have been in a place for a long season and you're wondering how to get to the next spot. Uh, that you are wondering how to cross over. You're wondering how to uh, you know, many people go to church their entire lives and that's all they ever do is go to church. They never have a deep encounter with Jesus. They never go to the next level. They just go through the same old, same old thing and they do the same old thing for their whole life. And they think that that's what God called them to. Let me just tell you, God's called you for more than that. And so tonight we're going to walk through that if we can for just a moment. Um, I'm going to do the best I can to be as calm as possible until the anointing of the Holy Ghost grips me and then you might do some jelly. Hallelujah. Second uh, Kings chapter two, we're going to read verse one through six. Now, let me set the story up here. Elisha is being mentored by a man named Elijah. Uh, very familiar story, familiar prophets. Elijah is a prophet to the is a prophet to the nations. He's raised up to do all the great things. And he grabs Elisha. I guess he just went around to try to find somebody who had a similar name. Uh, I always wondered why they picked Elijah and Elisha to be best friends and do everything together. Um, it's very hard to communicate when we're trying to preach this. But Elijah is getting ready to come to the end of his life. And he recognizes that he's coming to the end. And he knows that Elisha is going to take on the mantle or the anointing that he carries. And as they're walking into this place, they, they begin to travel to these different territories. And as they're traveling to these different territories, to these different cities, on a journey, they find that there are people who are proclaimed Christians, the Bible calls them prophets, that are standing on the sidelines and giving strict instructions but how many of you know that the word of God always outweighs the word of man? Yeah. You have to know that you know that you know that when God speaks, you don't fear. Yeah. Because the Bible says that there's wisdom in the multitude of counselors. But I believe that there is confusion in the multitude of opinions. Yeah. And most people want to give their opinion on your life. Yeah. 
And what happens in that opinion is it begins to dilute the word of God and you begin to veer right or left because in the beginning when God speaks, we are very clear. God, I know what I'm going to do. And then, you know, Sally or Susie or Johnny or whoever tells you, well, you know, I, I just think maybe you should do this. I think maybe you should do this. Well, I, I was praying and I believe you should do this. And by the time a couple months goes by, the word that you got from God, you begin to go, well, maybe I'll just wait on it. Yeah. And tonight I want to encourage you that God has called you for such a time as this. And just as Elisha had a word from God, he stood the ground, he walked the path, he stayed focused, yeah. and, he, and he received a double portion. Yeah. Amen. Second Kings 2, chapter, or chapter 2, uh, 1 through 6, uh, I'll be reading in the, what version is this in, sorry. I believe this is in the NLT version, but you can follow along whatever's good for you. All right. And it came to pass when the Lord was about to take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. Then Elijah said to Elisha, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to Bethel. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So then they... So they went down to Bethel. Now the sons of the prophets who were at Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? And he said, yes, I know. Keep silent. I have a different word for keep silent. I usually just say, shut up. Amen. Sometimes you just need to tell people in your life, shut up. Then Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. Now the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho came to Elisha and said to him, do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? And so he answered, yes, I know. Shut up. <laughs> or he says, keep silent. He's kind. Then Elijah said to him, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on the Jordan. Do you see a pattern? But he said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So the two men, so the two of them went on and 50 men of the sons of the prophets went and stood facing them at a distance while the two of them stood by the Jordan. Now Elijah took his mantle, rolled it up, and struck the water and was divided this way and that, and so the two of them crossed over. Somebody say cross over. And so it was when they had crossed over that Elijah said to Elisha, ask what may I do for you before I'm taken away from you. From you. Elisha said, please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. So he said, you have asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I am taken from you, it shall be so for you but if not it shall be not so so then it happened as they continued on and talked that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them and elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven and elisha saw it and then he cried out my father my father the chariot of israel and its horsemen so he saw him no more and he took a hold of his clothes and tore them into pieces he also took up the mantle of elijah that had fallen from him and went back to the went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him, struck the water and said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? Yes. Stop there. Um, there are about 4,000 sermons that you can preach out of this six verses. I want to focus on a couple of things tonight and I might veer a little bit, but I really want to focus on the four places that they went. I want you to write down four words. If you have notes, if you have a neighbor, write it on them. Uh, write, write it somewhere. Write it on your phone. Write these four words down. Because I believe that these four words are something that will help you to, to cross over into a place of double portion. And we'll talk about what a double portion means in just a second. But I need you to write these four words down. Write the word desperation. Desperation. Write the word revelation. Write the word anticipation. And the word demonstration. You say it one more time. Desperation. 
revelation, anticipation, and demonstration. You got all those? If you don't, ask your neighbor. Hallelujah. There are four specific places that Elijah takes Elisha. And as he's taking them there, now understand how Elisha and Elijah came to meet. Elijah came to Elisha's property, to his house, and said, hey, let's go. It's time for you to follow God all the days of your life, and it's time for you to go into ministry. And Elisha, the Bible says, burns all of his stuff, burns the, burns the plow, burns the field, burns the cows, doesn't sacrifice. I mean, he leaves it, he leaves it, he leaves everything behind to follow this man. Elisha knows that there is something there and there are many people that would tell him along the way, what are you doing? Why are you going to that church? Why you go there every Thursday night? That's lame. You should go to the big church down the road. Why would you go sit in that place? What do you think you're doing? And Elisha always had to look at the place that God had called him and said, because the word of God is valued more than the word of man. And I'm going to stay where God's called me to be because I refuse to be out of the will of God. And so Elisha gets to this place where they're at the end of the journey. They've walked through life, a lot of life together. They get to the end of this place where they find, their play, they find themselves in a place called Gilgal. Now Gilgal, most people would think that you could go find Gilgal, but Gilgal is not necessarily a geographical location. Gilgal is mentioned 59 times in the Bible. Gilgal is not a place like you can go find um, you can go find uh, the city of Jericho or you can go find the, the uh, Mount Carmel or you can go to the Holy Land and find all the different things. There is not a there is not a geographical location for Gilgal because Gilgal is where everybody would call their starting place. It was a place where they would build an altar. It was a place where they would assemble and say, we're going to start something. It was the place where if you and I were today to talk about what Gilgal is to us, we would say it was the place where we first encountered God. It was the place where we said yes to salvation. It was the place where we said yes for him to come in and do a mighty work in our lives. It was a place called Gilgal. It was a place of desperation. Listen, most people don't come to Jesus because they're having a great day. Most people don't come to Jesus because they're just like, wow, I've got a million dollars in the bank. I've got no worries in my life. Most people come to Jesus because they are desperate for a change in their life. Listen, there's only two reasons why people change in life. They either know enough or they heard enough. It's the only two reasons why people will ever change. You learn and you, you get knowledge and you go, wow, I'm stupid. That was dumb. I should never do that again. I've learned my lesson. If you have kids, I have four of them. Every time after they would do something stupid and they all do stuff stupid still, I would sit them down and say, have you learned anything from this? Yeah. I have. I'm, I'm not going to do that again. Good, you learn. Sometimes they wouldn't learn. And they would continue to do the same thing over again. They would continue to do that. And my, my wife and I would look at our kids and say, what in the world are you doing? This isn't like your third offense or fourth offense. This is like we told you over and over, don't do this. But it took something else for them to learn because they couldn't learn off of what I was telling them. They had to get to a point where it hurt them bad enough where they said, I don't want to hurt anymore, so I'm not going to do that. Right. Most people that walk in addiction can't get out of addiction until they get to the place where they hurt enough that says, I can't do this anymore. I'm done. Right. And most people come and find Jesus because they're at a place that says, my life is screwed up. I can't figure out what I'm doing and I need to change it. So I'm here to find God. Yes. I'm here at a Gilgal moment in the place called desperation. Yes. I'm here to find my starting place with God. Oh, right. mm -hmm. But did you know that every time you get to a, another level with God, there's always people that come back into your life to tell you that you don't need what you have. Yes. You find Jesus, you get the word, 
Elisha gets to a place where it's a starting point. It's a new beginning. And Elijah, his mentor, listen, the, pe the person that he has left everything for is standing next to him. He says, hey, you should probably stay here because I'm going. And he says, oh, no, you ain't going nowhere. I, if, if you're living, I'm walking. If, if, if you're doing that, I'm going with you. And not only was it the person that was leading him, it was 50 sons of the prophets that were standing on the sidelines of his life. Listen, we all have sideline prophets in our lives. They're mostly self-proclaimed. Oh, well, I was reading my word this morning. Sure you were. I bet you were. You were really praying really hard for me, weren't you? No, you just have an opinion and your flesh is rising up and you want to tell me what you think. And the 50 men were on the sideline going, hey, you know he's going to die, right? He's old. He's out. Why are you going to waste your time walking with this guy? Right. He says, yeah, I know all that stuff. Shut up. <laughs> and he keeps walking with him. That might be a little intense. I don't know. Sometimes I'm not trying to, you know, in some cultures, shut up is like a really bad word. I'm not trying to be rude if I offend you. Uh, it's Prophet John's fault. <laughs> so they leave Gilgal. And they get to a place called Bethel. The word Bethel means the house of God. Most people, I, I want to identify and apply the word to our lives or what it looks like today. Most, most people in the world today will, will encounter Jesus at some point in time. And then their next step is to find a church. Most people will find the house of God where they get there and they get the scriptures read to them because, you know, 90% of Christians don't read their Bible. They wait for the pastor to read it to them. If I'm stepping on your toes, trust me, I'm just, I'm just here to help you. I promise. But people come to church because the pastor reads the word. They get a little bit of something that they need. But most people, I'm just being honest, most people, they probably couldn't find a physical Bible in their house if they needed to. Luckily, we have a Bible app on our phone because this is way more important than a Bible. Most people can't leave home without their phone, but they can't find their Bible for two years. Can I tell you, if we couldn't find this phone for about two hours, we'd be freaking out, calling our phone, uh, hey, dinging every notification and location services. I'm calling my, my cell phone provider, telling them to cancel my, I mean, it would be an intense thing. Yeah. I can be, I, today I was on the plane and, and there was a moment where I thought I, I left my phone and I thought, I thought I was having a heart attack because I left, I left the, you know, we were at the gate and I get in the, I, I, this lady, I was helping this lady put her luggage up in the thing. I don't know why the littlest, most frail little ladies bring the 90 pound carry-ons. I'm like, do you actually think you're actually gonna get that up there? And they just do this a couple times until somebody's like, can I help you, man? I'm like, that is so manipulating. Don't do that. But she did that and she got me. And I was like, man, let me help you. And she's like, oh, thank you. I'm like, oh yeah, sure, whatever. <laughs> and so I throw it up in the, in the overhead, find her seat. I sit down, I'm getting all my stuff. And then I look and I go, where's my phone? And I was like, and, and for that moment, it's like just panic. It's just like a cold sweat hits your body. And you're like, oh, I thought I left it on the chair out there at the gate. And I get ready to get up and be like, you know, once you run out, you're out of luck. I mean, it's a bad deal. They don't let you run in and out of the plane. Right. Once you're in, you're in. Once you're out, you're out. And I'm like, oh, no. So I'm like, look around. And, and where I lose most of my stuff on the plane is that little netting pocket in the seat in front of me. I, I, it's only this big, but it's like a never-ending hole because I lose so much stuff down in there. Every plane ride. And I thought I'd looked, but apparently I didn't see it. And right before I was getting ready to like run out and scream, where's my phone? I found it, took me about half the plane ride to calm down and be like, it's gonna be okay, you're all right, your life is all right. But do you know what? I, I, I have to be honest, I don't typically do that with my Bible. I'm not always like, oh my gosh, where's my Bible? Now obviously I have my Bible on my phone on my iPad, 
But even when I would carry a physical Bible, it, I, 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 could, I could accidentally leave at a church. And I wasn't calling the pastor to be like, hey, I left my Bible at church. I, can, you, can you get somebody to open that up? I got to get it. I, I can't live, I can't make it through the night without it. Like I got I got message, I got things I gotta get out of that thing. I wasn't calling him, I, I just get it next Sunday. Yeah. I go a whole week without my Bible. It wasn't that important. But most Christians, as Elisha finds, he gets to the place called Bethel, called the house of God, and he was there at this place where He's at this. He's at this moment where he's getting revelation. He's get. He was desperate for the things that Elijah had. He was desperate for the things that God had. And they came to this place called Bethel, where they had revelation aha moments, where they got the word downloaded to them. And he's in this moment where ninety percent of Christians stay their entire life. They stay in a place where they gain salvation. They, they accept and sign on the dotted line to become members of a church. And they're like, oh, this is I found eternity right here. But let me tell you, there is so much more. And most people will tell you as long as you get saved and go to church, that's all you need. Listen, God didn't send his son to die on the cross just so you could sit in a pew and listen to some crazy man preach. God sent his son to die on the cross so you could have life and life more abundantly. We don't serve a God that was. We serve a God that is. He is for you, not against you. He wants to see you live and not die. And there comes a time when we have to recognize what season am I in? Am I in a guilt? You know, you could be in Gilgal your entire life. Well, I got saved. I'm going to heaven. Woo, that's all I need. Good enough for me. As long as I ain't going to go to hell, I don't care what else happens. Well, you know, I stayed there for 30 years, but now I kind of, I'm, I'm getting involved in church. I stand at the door and hand out a, and hand out a bulletin. Um, I lead the song service. That's what they call them back in the old day. I'm a worship leader. I'm part of the worship team. I'm on the computer. This guy probably needs a break. You were in the same spot doing the same thing the last time I was here. He's just like, this guy might need a partner in crime so where he can actually just sit and enjoy the service. Maybe he needs somebody to help him do that. Everybody, listen, we, we have different structures and systems in church now. Back when I was a kid, when we go to church, everybody did everything. We had random people. People running in circles around the church, flopping at the altars, doing all kinds of crazy things. As a kid, I sat there going, good Lord, I'm never bringing my friends to this place. This place is nuts. But did you know most of us have found our place either in Gilgal or Bethel? And we've never made it on. And can I tell you that most pastors have done a disservice to the bride? Because we preach for years that get saved and go to church. Right. Because most pastors preach to fill their, their services more than they do to fill heaven. Come on. And I'm not being mean to pastors. I'm not trying to be. I'm just telling you that it's a high stress. It's a high level of life. When you are, when you are pastoring a church, when you're responsible for a congregation, when you're responsible for the finances and the well-being of a house. Yeah. You don't. You want to get people into the church, so you preach and you want people to be in. But that's as far as some people will ever take them. I'm thankful that this church is a church that wants to take it to to a double portion, and I'm thankful that they have pastors here that are leading it in a great way. Elisha and Elijah get to a place called Bethel, the place of revelation. They were in desperation. They were in a place that said Elijah told Elisha, "Hey, I'm going to leave from you, and, and you can stay here." His, his, he got a pit in his stomach and he said, uh-uh, I left my family, I left, I burned my cows, I, I done burned everything for you, I'm leaving. He got desperate, he said, I'm following you. And then that moment they come to Bethel and he goes, okay, look, you're at the house of God, you're here, just stay, I'm going to go. And there's people saying, look, this is the call of God on your life to come and sit in this chair, sing those five songs clap and cheer for the pastor and then go home and do the same thing next week. That's called the spirit of religion. And that's entrapped most of the church today. But they don't stop there. He says, God's called me to a place called Jericho. Now Jericho is an interesting place because it's the place that Joshua found. It's the place that Joshua, everybody heard the song or you've read the story. 
Joshua fought the battle of Jericho and the walls came tumbling down. Now, if you've been in church any amount of time, it's a famous story. Uh, and most people know that they marched around the walls. And most people get this number wrong, but does anybody know? And, and I don't want to embarrass anybody, but actually I won't tell you. You just say it silently and you can pretend like you do. I ask people all the time, how many times did they march around the wall? People say, oh, that's easy, seven. They marched around seven times, that's what the Bible says. I said, no, they didn't march around seven. They marched around one time a day for six days. And on the seventh day, they marched around seven. I'm not great at math, but seven plus six is 13. They marched around Jericho 13 times. Now, that's the story we know. But Jericho represents a place of great faith. Because what Joshua did to defeat Jericho was something that had never been done before. To go to battle and fight without weapons and without violence. Tell me one battle. No, 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 don't tell me. I don't want to hear I want, to, I want anybody to be accountable for hitting somebody. Amen. <laughs> Think back in your life before Christ. Hallelujah. Back when you were a kid, with your siblings, whatever. Just think when you got into an argument. Think when you got into your first fight. Maybe you've never been in a fight. Bless you. Hallelujah. Some of us have been in too many fights growing up as kids. Some of you have been in too many fights as adults. Some of you need deliverance tonight from fighting. I don't know what's happening. But I'm just saying. Just think about this. Think if you were going to, think if somebody, you, you're driving down the road tonight, somebody makes you mad, you get out, they get in an argument, and you just start walking around their car 13 times, you don't say anything. <laughs> They're like, look, 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 look. I gotta stop, I'm getting dizzy. I can't do 13 of those. But people would think, I lost his mind. It might win the fight for you. They're probably like, dude, you're crazy. We're not going to hit you today. We're going to leave you. I've, I've, told, I've told my kids before, I'm like, hey, if you ever get in trouble and you feel like something's going to happen, like you know, somebody's going to take you or somebody's going to fight you and, and you, can't, you can't protect yourself, just act like you're either physically or mentally like just unstable. <laughs> just, just lay down and just go off. And people will be like, all right, all right you win. Then we'll go back. The best defense has nothing to do with the story. <laughs> Joshua fights a battle. He goes to take a city and he doesn't have weapons and they're not going to fight. That takes something either, either really far to the side of stupidity or great, great, great faith. If you read in Joshua chapter 5, when they're going to go into Jericho, Joshua encounters the angel or the commander of the Lord's army. And he's crossing, he's getting ready to cross over. And, and, and they say he's like a, a nine foot angel. Now, I don't care if it was a two foot angel. If I saw an angel, I'd be like, who are you? Listen, I could see a mouse run across the floor right now and be like, whoa, 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 somebody get the mouse. The mouse is this big, I'm this big. I still don't like mice, all right? And that's why somebody's like, it's just a little mouse. I'm like, I don't know why, but I don't want to get near it. I don't want to touch it. There's certain things some people are scared of spiders. I have a lady that works at our, at our church and, and she can see anything move. Anything. I feel like even if a fly, she's like, whoa, 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 what is it? What is it? I'm like, calm down. She could see a, she could see a spider from here over there on the wall. And she would walk. I don't know where that door goes, but she wouldn't either. She would walk out. She, I mean, where are you going? There's a spider all the way over on that wall. We get scared of the littlest things. And the Bible says that he sees this huge angel. Now, seeing little things that are in the physical is bad enough. Seeing a spiritual being. Come on. It's enough for me to go, all right, who's playing a joke on me? Where's the hologram? I'd be rubbing my eyes. What's happening? 
And when the dude starts talking to me, I'd be like, I'm out. I'm out. I'm not, I'm, we're not having a conversation today. And Joshua encounters this, this angel and he stops. And he says, are you for us or against us? And the angel offers an interesting, interesting answer. He says, neither. He says, I'm the commander of the Lord's army. Here's what the angel of the Lord is saying. Here's what God is saying. I didn't come to take sides. I came to take over. See, there's a difference in our lives when we try to get God to do what we want him to do or when we surrender our will to what he wants to do. Most of the time we want God in our lives because we think he's a genie in a bottle and say, hey, God, I'll serve you if you do what I say. And Joshua comes to this angel and goes, hey, are you going to help us defeat Jericho or not? And he says, I'm not here to do any of those things. What I'm here to do is take over in this situation. I'm here to prove to you that through your gift of faith and believing in what I've told you, believing what I've promised you, I will walk you through to the next season of your life. If you don't shrink back and you don't give up, I'll be the God that saves you in this moment. There has to be a moment where we understand if God said it, he'll do it. And many times we get to a place where we argue with God and we get discouraged because some idiotic person on the sideline of our life who isn't even allowed to speak in our life says something and goes, and we go, oh, guys, it's not going to happen. Joshua had to leave. Listen, it wasn't just Joshua. He led thousands and thousands of people. Line up. They're like, yeah, we're going to fight. Everybody shut up. Nobody's saying a word. We're just going to walk around the city. They're like, Joshua, you're an idiot. Why are we walking around the city? We want to go kill some people. They march around the city for a week. And because of the great faith, the walls come crumbling down. They don't have to do anything. God does it all. Yes. Now, in a moment, we have to understand that what Elijah is showing Elisha is, are you going to get stuck with salvation being good enough? Are you going to get stuck at church just being okay? Are you going to get stuck in a place where God promised you something and you're just waiting and waiting and waiting to get to the next thing? Because, see, there's a... There's a desperation that comes at salvation. There's a, there's a revelation that comes in the place of the house of God. But then when God gives you the gift of faith and you can see something rising, there's an anticipation that begins to stir in your belly. There's something that believes that, hey, tomorrow it's going to be better than today. I believe that that job I was going to get is going to come about. I believe that relationship that was going to get restored is going to happen. I believe the kid that's a prodigal is going to come running home. I believe that this church is going to be filled. I don't just sit in these seats just to, just to sit here. I believe that God's getting ready to burn revival upon this building. See, there's promises that God has made. But through desperation, through revelation, and through anticipation, there comes a place where we have to understand. Elisha says, I'm not staying here. If God said it, He'll do it. I left all my stuff behind years ago, all because I knew there was something that God had for me. And I'm walking this journey out and I'm not stopping in any season. I'm not getting stuck. I'm moving to the place of double portion. And they get to the place of the Jordan and all through the places that they walk, there are people telling him, do you know the guy's going to die? They say the same thing over and over and over again. Can I tell you, if you will actually evaluate the voices of the people that speak into your life, they've probably been saying the same thing over and over and over again, and you keep believing the lie of the enemy. And I'm here today to be a different voice to tell you, if God promised you can do it, you can do it. 
No more ups and downs, just ups and ups. No more times of this roller coaster ride of life that said, well, I was having a good day and then all of a sudden I fell back into addiction. I fell back into sin. Listen, you don't have to live in sin. Most people justify and they say, well, the Bible says in Romans that we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. Let me, let me help you understand what that verse actually says. We have all sinned. Come on. Past tense. And fallen short of the glory of God. It doesn't say we will sin. It doesn't say we are sin. It says we have sin. You have the potential and the ability to live holy. You have the ability to live in this world and not be of this world. Because greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. He's called me to be an overcomer. He is a victorious God. Let's put victory inside of me. I don't have to live in sin anymore. Probably got too close to that camera. So sorry. Wow, that's a very big forehead. Sorry. Speaking of big foreheads, um, we've been doing ministry in the villages in Alaska and um, we're getting ready to go back in a couple of weeks to a village called Point Hope. It's the most northwest village that you can go in the state of Alaska, which is very cold. And um, the Inupak tribe, the Eskimos there that we were ministering to. I mean, revival in the village. I mean, people just a building about twice as big as this building. I mean, people just crammed in. They had altars in their little building where people would kneel down and pray. They had about five people that would come to the church. And they, they had so many people that take the altars and set them down the aisles so people could sit and have room. They opened the doors of the lobby so people could stand out in the lobby and watch. I mean, revival people flooding into this place and don't even understand. And build a great relationship with them and uh, prayed and prophesied and declared the word of the Lord over this these great, great people that I, that I now have a newfound love for. And they said, um, we're getting ready to leave when we were there last. And they said, Pastor, uh, we have a, a new name for you. It's your Eskimo name. I said, oh, good. I thought, you know, it'd be something awesome. It sounds awesome until you find the meaning of it. And uh, they said, uh, I said, what is it? They said, it's Sasuri. I said, ah, Sasuri. I got, ooh, man, me Sasuri. You know, like, ooh. I felt, I felt good. I was like, what does that mean? And they just kind of smiled. And I was like, well, what does it mean? They said, it means beluga whale. Oh. I said, oh, all right. Big forehead, white, I get it. Thank you. I don't know how to take this right now. Then they told me that it's one of the most, the, 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 the whale that uses radar. And so they named it for the prophet a gift. Come on. Oh, that's good. That you can sense things. I got a little insecure and I was like, the big, fat, white, big forehead <laughs> whale. That's me. Now I've accepted it. Elisha gets to the place of the Jordan, the place of crossing over. Now it says that the crowd has gotten closer and they're face to face. Before they were on the sidelines. Hey, hey, hey he's going to die. You're dumb for following him. You're wasting your time going to that church. You're wasting your time praying. You're wasting your time. You're, it, Come on. Now they're at the they're at the final spot to where I'm ready to walk into what God's promised. And now it says they're standing face to face, going, "Told you he's going to die." And God goes, "Yeah, I know." Shh. Uh, up. That's all I can say. Shut up. Get out of my face. And the Bible says that Elijah takes off his cloak, which would be, um, his cloak would be like a, a shawl that would be laid over, could have been part of his tallit, which would be his prayer moment that he would have his prayer tent that would hang over with tassels. He takes his cloak or his mantle and he strikes the water and the Bible says that the water goes this way and that. And they cross over. Jordan, the last place, is a demonstration. It's the place where water can't go this way and that. Jordan is a river. Rivers flow one way. 
When rivers flow the opposite way, there's only one way that rivers can flow the opposite way, and that's an act of God. One hit of the mantle, one hit of the cloak, and through a place of desperation, through a moment of revelation, through a place of anticipation, they find themselves in the demonstration. And it's those four places of life that if you'll get to a place, it goes, some of us never get desperate for God. Come on. And some of us have already been to, do I need to stay closer here? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'll stay right here. I'm sorry, I got this. I'm here. Me and you, we're right here. Is Prophet David on? He better be watching. He's not enough to talk to him later. Should have seen some of the pictures he was sending me. He's like, hey, should I put this as the picture for you guys? And I was like, you're a jerk. You definitely look like a balloon. Do not put that one up there. Some of us have been in every season of this. Most of you probably in this room have have been desperate, have, have gotten to a place where you, you felt like you went to church a little bit, you, you felt like you gained faith, and you even felt like, hey, I got some breakthrough and I made it to a place. Can I tell you this isn't a one-time event? You say, wait, I gotta get saved multiple times? No, but you do have to come back to a place of desperation for the things of God. My wife and I are getting ready to celebrate 25 years of marriage. And um, we got married when we were 12. And um, so we're still very young. Um, I'm just kidding. Um, that would be illegal. But uh, we need help. So sorry. Uh, we, we got married very, very young, and um, I'm 46 years old. We're getting ready to cel celebrate our 25th wedding anniversary in just a couple of weeks. And uh, we have decided to renew our vows. Does that mean I'm not married right now? No, I'm as married as I've ever been right now. But what I'm going to do is I'm desperate to not lose my first love. I'm desperate to go back and re-engage and say, I want to renew some things. I want to make it, I want to make it fresh again. I want to get desperate for the things. I, I, I want to go on dates again. I, I want to do the things that, that I did when I was when I was in love and I would I would chase you around like a lost puppy. I want to do the things that when I first met you, I was like, that's my girlfriend. I don't want to be married for 30 years ago. Yeah, that's my wife. Come on, recap. That's her. I'm stuck. Ball and chain. Did you know that when you come into covenant with Jesus, when you accept him, you become in, you come to a marriage. It's actually he calls us his bride. He's called the bridegroom. And what he wants to know is, are you desperate enough to re re-engage and renew vows with me to come back into covenant with me? Or do you just get to a place of crossing over to do what I, you wanted me to do? And then you just say, well, my life's over. Yeah, that's Jesus. He sometimes hears me. Sometimes he doesn't. Just like my husband, half the time he doesn't listen. I, I'm just saying, we treat God like we treat our spouses or our best friends. And we don't want to get back to that place because that means we're going to have to do something that re-engages our first love. In Revelation 2, 4, it says the one thing that I hold against you yeah. is that you have forsaken your first love. Right. Sometimes that can mean that you walked out of covenant with God. Sometimes that can mean that you walked away from God. And I know many people preach a hyper grace message and that you can, you can get saved once and go live by hell and still go to heaven. I don't believe that one bit. I don't believe that at all. I believe you have the ability to walk away from God, to lose your salvation, to walk away and say, I, I don't want it anymore. God's not a forceful God. We don't get the ability to go live however we want and just say, well, I'll say sorry tomorrow. Try to do that in a marriage. Let me know how that works. If I did that to my wife, I would have made it about two days, not 25 years. Well, you know, honey, I just didn't feel like loving you today, so I just want to love somebody else. Oh, my wife was very beautiful. But they were the ugly when it came out there, I promise. But that's how we treat God. Right. And what God is saying is, is that rain? Yes. That's prophetic. 
I know it rains here a lot, but I'm just saying that's prophetic. What God is saying, it doesn't rain here a lot? Okay, good. Well, then it is very prophetic. Hallelujah. Yes. What God is saying is there is a moment where the things that I called you to, you've got distracted by the sideline prophets. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying prophets. Like, Prophet John is a prophet. Prophet David Fang is a prophet. Yeah. I saw Bishop Hooks is coming. Prophet. Yeah. Exactly. I'm not talking about people that God has called to be prophets. I'm talking about, when I say sideline prophets, I'm talking about sideline voices that say things that aren't godly, that yeah. we believe as the word of God. Yeah. God's asking us tonight, the things that you think that you've always done, Maybe you've done a great job, but there's more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're willing to engage in a place of desperation, yeah. if you're willing to engage in this place called the church, this place called Bethel, yes. the house of God, yeah. Yeah. if you're willing to pray and believe for the gift of faith, listen, faith isn't just something that, that happens. Faith is something that is exercised. The Bible says that faith without works is dead. Faith is something that we have to do every day. We have to pray for. It's a gift that is given to you. Everybody is given a measure, but you can grow your faith. How do you grow your faith? Go walk around Jericho 13 times when somebody says you shouldn't. I remember when my uh, we were living in Missouri, and my wife wanted this uh, this car. It was a it was an expedition, and it was out of our price range. And my wife was like, oh, I really want that. That's the perfect car. I was like, eh, why don't I get like the, uh, you know, Geo Metro or something. That's something that's like $30,000 less. And she's like, oh, but I, I, I said, okay, listen, here's what we're going to do. We were youth pastors at the time. And so we got like 10 of the kids of the youth group. We said, hey, at, at 9 o'clock tonight, meet us over at the car dealership. They said, why? I said, because we're going to march around the car. They said, what? I said, yeah, we're going to march around it. We're going to speak in tongues. And if it's God, it's going to give us this car tomorrow. And so you know what we did? People were honking. Like the, we went at 9 o'clock at night because all the salesmen were gone then. And so I told them we weren't going to get arrested. But there was, a, there was a whole crew of us like ringing around the road yet around this car. And we're like, and we're marching around this thing at nine o'clock at night, 13 times. God, if it's your will, give us the car. The next day, the guy calls, hey, um, can you come in? Our, our manager is going to just make a great deal on this thing. And I feel like we can give you like, I gave you like $8,000 more on my trade in. I was like, 8,000. Did you miss it that much? Or were you really trying to mess me over? What were you doing here, buddy? We ended up getting this car. For like such a discounted price, it was right in our budget. Got just what we needed. My wife got the car for dreams. Why? I had to expand my faith. God said, I'll give it to you. I need to know if you're going to do it or not. God, I'm not going to go walk around the car. That's dumb. <laughs> now all of you watch it. You're going to be out there. I'm going to drive by the car. You're going to be out there. walk around this car. I'm going to walk around this Mustang right here. This is awesome. <laughs> Walk around doing somebody's house. <laughs> I got over the sale sign. Excuse me, can I get in your backyard? I'm just gonna walk around 13 times. <laughs> Don't do that. All right, you might get arrested. That would not be a good idea. You all need help. There is a moment where God is asking you, what are you willing to do? We want a double portion. What is a double portion? He asked for a double portion of Elijah's spirit. It's a double portion of anointing. That's a double portion of, of blessing. I mean, it's one thing to be blessed. Double blessing, God will take it. Just like you said in the offering tonight, that he'll, pour, he'll open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing you can't contain. That's double portion. When, when the Bible says so many times, and, and Luke, when the Bible says when you give, I'll give it back to you, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. There's a God that wants to bless us, yeah. but there are certain protocols to getting blessing. Did you know that every every promise in the Word of God is un is conditional, except for salvation. Salvation is unconditional. Right. 
Salvation's free. Salvation, anybody got, anybody want it, anybody can get it. Every other promise is an if-then promise. If you do your part, then he can do his. And did you know that most people want God to do his part, then, the, then we'll do ours? We have a backward. God, I will start tithing if you just give me that new job. Right. And God says, start tithing and I'll give you the new job. Well, God, I, I really, 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 God, I will start going to church if you let that pretty girl over there notice me. I want to get married. Well, I'll give you the wife that you want if you start going to church. I'm just saying, we make deals with God based upon if he does his part, we'll do ours. And that's not the God we serve. The God that we serve says, you do what I've asked you to do, then I promise you that I will do mine. It is a gift of faith that has to rise in us to believe that if we want a double portion, we have to walk through some serious seasons that gets us to the place of crossing over. 8.30, what time do we end? I forgot to ask that important question. Every time you want. Oh, Lord, don't say that. <laughs> um, in just a moment, though, I don't know if if we have like just some music we can play in the background, some altar music, just stuff like that. You can start playing that now. I want to minister for a little bit. There is a, a season for some of you in this room that you have you've allowed your circumstance to determine your future. Thank you so much. Never allow the pain of the moment to keep you from the promise of God. Many times the devil will manipulate us in the pain and tell us that we got it wrong. We missed the mark. There's no way. The only thing that will ever void the promise in your life is the unwillingness to walk through the process. The process, the process is what brings the promise. The process of Gilgal, Bethel, Jericho, and Jordan. Desperation, revelation, anticipation, demonstration. Some of us quit in the process because the pain was too far, too much to go the distance. Tragedy, loss, wounds, bitterness, rejection, defilement. It caused you to back up and say, I don't know about this God thing. Listen, I'm here to tell you today that this God thing's real. I can tell you story after story about what is happening in our church. People that are coming in. California's got some serious gangs. Um, had a guy come to our church and in the middle of preaching, God said, he was a Hispanic guy sitting towards the back. And, you know, he looked he looked clean cut. He didn't he didn't look like gangster. I mean, not that I'm stereotyping, but I mean he didn't look like he was gonna come like knife me or anything, you know, he looked like a respectable guy. And I mean, I, I was just staring at him and God said, give him your shoes. I said, God, I'll preach him. He said, take off your shoes and give him your shoes. I said, oh, I'm going to walk around with my socks. That's awkward. He said, yeah, give him your shoes. I said, oh, my man's shoes might not fit him. And like, I argued with God for about 20 minutes while I was preaching. I didn't argue out loud. I'm not, I'm not like, like, people don't think I'm going to, nope. And anyway, Elijah came, God, I said no. Like, I'm not like crazy like that. I'm just saying like silently, my spirit was like, it was, I, was having, I was struggling. I've never taken off my shoes while I was preaching. And I don't, you never know how your shoes are going to smell after you take them off. After you've been, I've been sweating in them all day. And I'm like, I'm going to give them dirty, smelly, sweaty shoes. And be like, hey, you're, you want my shoes? He's probably like, you're a jerk. And I said, I've never met this man. And so, finally I just stopped. I said, sir, I need to do something because God's telling me to, to do this. I know I'm pointing at you and said, sir, I'm so sorry. I'm, 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 it's in my mind. I'm like, there he is right there in the empty pew. <laughs> sir, 
Thank you, Mr. I said, I have to do something. God told me to give you my shoes. And he just looked at me. I said, I know it's weird. And he's just staring at me. And I'm taking my shoes off. And I said, can you, can you come up here to the front? And as he's coming up to the front, I see tears start to roll down his face. He walks to the front, I give him my shoes, and he goes, do you want mine? I was like, no, I don't want yours. I just need to give you mine. Long story short, this was a year and a half ago. He was the lead shot caller for one of the major gangs in our city. And God had told him, he didn't know it was God. He had a dream. I said, he said, you're gonna, you need to go to this church because you're going to run a new race. And it was a dream. And he was in a, a sprint running like a track. And he had to go get track shoes in his, in his, in his dream. He had to get spikes, the shoes to run with. And and it was something for him when I gave him the shoes. It was a it was a changeover, and and now he's a, a leader in our church. And another guy came who was the other opposing gang leader, and now they do this street preaching out in the middle of the streets. Like these guys were, these guys have done serious jail time. They. I mean, the stories that you hear about their lives, that they should still be in jail. And God saved them. And now this, we've got this gnarly crowd that comes to church that I love. And I, I've never, I, I got one speeding ticket in my life. I, I've never drank alcohol. I've never smoked a cigarette. I rented a minivan last week that smelled like weed, so it might have been my first time with marijuana. <laughs> But other than that, I've never done anything. I've never done a drug. And they they listen to me and they're like, what is happening with this guy? And they're bringing their friends and they're bringing people off the streets that are rough. We had to up our security team a little bit. We weren't sure exactly who was coming to like fight them or actually coming to church. But it's all worth it. I can't tell you what happens when you when you choose to say, God, I'll go through the process. I didn't want to go to California. I didn't want to go sit in the place that was made up of fruits and nuts and nobody wanted to be there anyway. I didn't want to sit alongside a bunch of heathens. I called the place Nineveh and said, listen, Jonah didn't want to go there and I don't want to go to California. It's people that don't want to hear the word of God and they're all going to die and go to hell anyway. And God said, that's why you have to go. I don't want to go to California. But now I'm finding that the greatest harvest is there. But I had to get to a place of desperation with God. I had to get back to that place and say, God, I'll do anything for you. And now he's walking us through another season of crossing over. In your life today, there's a season of crossing over. You don't have to wait. You don't have to back up. You don't have to think, well, they told me I'm not ready. They told me, yeah, who's they? If they ain't God, then they ain't nobody. Because God is for you, not against you. He believes in you. He believes in you. And I don't know, I, I think you're one of the new people here. Is this whole crew right here? You're, you're here? Is this your home church? These are your friends? God's for you. You've waited many, many years out of serious hurt and struggle from family that have caused you to walk away and not trust anybody. You have an interesting personality that you tend to shrink back and shut down until you've had too much and then you straight lose your mind. And I'm telling you, God's going to restore some things. How old are you? 27. There has been more cuts to your heart than most people will ever encounter in a lifetime. Relationship after relationship has wounded you. 
I'm not here to embarrass you. I'm here to let you know that God's been watching you. And God doesn't, God doesn't waste anything. The Bible says when the enemy meant for bad, God will turn for good. I don't know what the relationship is like with your dad, but there was an interesting dynamic that brought rejection on you as a young man that you said, I'm done. And it sent you into this spiral of, I can't win. I don't know if you have a good relationship with your dad now or if you know your dad. Do you know your dad? Do you have a good relationship with him now? No. There is a moment that caused you to question who you were as a person. And I'm here to tell you tonight, the only reason you came here tonight is because God wanted to tell you this. Son, I've called you when you were about nine years old. There was a traumatic event in your life. It shook you to the core. And at 13, you didn't care. By 16, you actually wanted to die. And you said, I'm done. I'm telling you tonight, God pulled you out. He brought you here to tell you this. He has a plan for your life. You will one day have this microphone in your hand and you will preach the word. You've ran from God. You've even disbelieved in God. There ain't no God. I don't believe that. If there was a God, why would all this happen? You've had some serious conversations in private with yourself. There's actually a level of bitterness that has rose in you that you say, if anybody could see my heart, they would see the pain that I've gone through. And I'm telling you, there has been hurt not only from people, but by yourself. You've hurt you. You've, you've sabotaged your future on purpose. And I'm here to tell you today, God is putting it back in place. Let me, can you stand with me? Let me pray for you for just a moment. What is your name? Name, stand with me. Nice to meet you, by the way. Father, I thank you for my brother. There's one more thing that happened. And it's like a memory that recirculates in your mind that you can't get away from. And I'm going to break it tonight and it's never going to come back. There's some things you have to change over the next couple of weeks. But hear me. God's getting ready to shake you like you've never been shook. God's getting ready to bring you out of the mud. He's bringing you out. It's almost like quicksand that you've been sitting in and every time you feel like you can get out, it takes you down deeper. And God says, son, this is the last of the last. I'm pulling you out tonight. I'm bringing you to the top. I'm putting your feet on solid ground. And tonight, you will be made whole in Jesus' name. I reverse the curse. I bind the spirit of rejection, isolation, intimidation. I declare tonight in Jesus' name that you will be made whole. You will preach the word. There's a new fire coming inside of you. Y'all just pray out loud for just a second.
when God shows up, we just wait upon Him. I can't wait to hear what God does. I'm going to keep in contact. You all live around here? You have a church you go to? Kind of, sort of? Kind of, sort of? Well, if you're in a church, plug in hard. If you're not, get into this one. We're not here to steal sheep. We're not here to steal church members. We're here to build the church. Yeah. If you don't have a place where you can lock in, you need to get in. Yes. Right, who are you to him? His mom. His mom? Well, we might as well pray for you too. Yes. Say with me. What's your name? Ross. Interesting dynamic of have you ever been married? Would that be his dad? So there's just a level of it's really rejection, but really it's it's almost hate. And it's just a, it might be a little bit extreme word, but it's just really just really cheap. I, I just see you in a place of shadows. I, I see you in a place of uh, I don't know if it's in a, a, a physical dark place or if it's just in a spiritually where you're just like kind of just hanging on for dear life. I see you in a place where you're just kind of holding on and, and holding on and holding on and every day is just another day. But God just gives me the word for you that his hand is settling upon you. There is some things that need to change drastically. Do you all live in the same house? No. Do you live by yourself? Right. Okay, you have two other kids. Uh, there are some things that need to shift in your household. And I don't know what that looks like, but you are, you have just, not that you don't care, you just don't have any more energy. You just wore out. And it's been a season of great struggle and very, very, very strenuous, high anxiety. There's even been some fear that has crept in of, how am I going to make it? What am I going to do? And it's, it's like every week is like another problem for you that you face. And it's really caused you to become overwhelmed. I don't know if there is a doctor's appointment or something that was released over you that, that told you, they diagnosed you with something or told, I don't know if it is emotionally or if it's physical, but something has brought fear upon your life. Today you're going to be healed. There is a, you both have got an interesting walk. You need to go back just a little bit further. But this is a generational thing that has been pushed off and pushed off. How many kids total? Four kids. The oldest is, and the youngest. You have a, a heart that has been tired of worrying, tired of wondering. And God says he's coming in to fulfill everything that you've ever prayed for. You have a praying mama's heart. You are one that prays, but you're also one that worries. You are a worrier from the day you wake up to the time you go to bed. It's a worry, 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 worry. You're always wondering if the worst could happen. It probably happened to you. And God says, my daughter, I am changing the circumstance. You will not be left alone. You will not. There's a, like a, a, a place of, it's not isolation. It's just loneliness, really. It's a place that feels like you can't get. It just, it just feels like even if you're in the middle of a crowd, you just feel like you're all alone. And God says, my daughter, I'm changing it tonight. 
he's healing your body. And I don't know if it was a doctor. I don't know if it's something self-diagnosed or something that was there that you don't know about. But God says, I'm healing your body tonight. There's been pain. And you've kind of avoided it. You've kind of not gone want to talk about it. But God says, I'm healing your body from the top of your head to the soles of your feet. You're healed tonight. He's also restoring your heart. There's an interesting word called love that you've you've chose to just not even really care about that word anymore because it doesn't make a lot of sense to you. And God says, my daughter, I'm wrapping my arms around you tonight. I'm showing you a father's love for real. I'm holding you in the lonely places. There's protection coming for you. This fear has to go in Jesus' name. God says, rise up. There's a new job opportunity coming for you. In the next six weeks, God says, I'm going to bring a new opportunity to you. You've waited and strived for a long time so that i got to do something different. And God says, now is the time to step out of faith. This is your crossing over moment. God, I pray God, do it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, it's almost 9 o'clock. Here's what we're going to do. Tomorrow, I'm going to preach short and pray long. I will pray over everybody. I will prophesy over everybody in the room. And we're going to see what God does. I would encourage you to everybody bring somebody. If you don't have a friend, go to Walmart and find one. All right? Stand in aisle eight and just wait for the first person to come down and just say, would you like to be my friend? It'd be amazing. All right? See if that works. Let me know. That might have been a prophetic word for somebody. If you don't like Walmart, go to Target. It's much better. Maybe you get a better friend. Listen, it's time to cross over. What we've always done can't be what we always do. It's time to change it up. It's time to go back to the place of desperation and say, God, take me to that new place. Tonight, your job is this. Go home, have a talk with Jesus. God, what do you want me to do? Then, call two or three people and say, come with me tomorrow night to church. Come with me. This guy's nuts. He's a big old whale. You're going to love to see him. I'm going to preach a short word tomorrow. And then we're going, we're going to play some music. Maybe not like a wedding march. Maybe like some serious music. We're going to play some good stuff. I'm just kidding. The music's fine. I really loved your worship, though. And I'm going to prophesy over you tomorrow, but I want to encourage you tonight. Have you led worship for a long time, or is this something they just threw you into? Um, this is the first time that I've led worship here, but it's not your first time. So. Right. So you sang on teams before, now you're leading. Yeah. Uh, there is another level. And uh, I don't know if you play the keyboard yet, but you should. Okay, so you need to start learning the keys. God just showed me that you would be playing and leading and writing songs. You're a songwriter at heart, but you're kind of timid of what people might think. And those words, but listen, you write the song that impresses God, not man. And anything from your heart impresses him. God will do the rest. But there is another level of excellence, and I'm, I won't say some of this for tomorrow night, but God is stepping you up. Who was that singing with you? Is she related to anybody? That's your daughter? Okay. Uh, she needs to, will she be here tomorrow night? Okay, she needs to stand here too. There's a, there's a mantle that needs to be shifted. I've led worship for many, many years, many years. I still lead worship at my church. I'm the worship leader and the pastor, hallelujah. And uh, I love it and I hate it. But I've led worship for, uh, since I was about 16 or 17 years old. And um, uh, my wife and I and my kids, uh, 
We've released multiple albums, have done all kinds of things. And I want to release over you and over, what's her name? Bella. Uh, just as Elijah passed over a cloak, I want to pass one over to you guys. And I believe there's an anointing that's going to come upon her and on you. And so tomorrow night we're going to do that. And we're going to pray over each of you. Ma'am, you have the gift of intercession. You've prayed for many, many years in silence. And God says that what you've done in private, I'm going to promote in public. He's given you major words that you've stood on, that you've declared, that you've never publicly proclaimed. And God says this season, he is releasing your voice to say it. You are a slice of humble pie. You could really care less if anybody knows or not. You know you love God. You know you pray. And you know that God is your everything. God says you're mine too. And God says tonight I'm elevating you. I'm taking you to another level. I'm downloading. I'm downloading and putting new things inside of you. The spirit of revelation, the rainbow word of God is going to fall upon you at a new level. I don't know if you used to sing as well, but there's a song in your heart. There's some songs that you sing, even some hymns that you sing from back in the day, if I could put it that way, that you honk. Might be amazing grace or I'll bring that word. I just see you as a person that is a, a worker, a servant, but has been in a place of despair and frustration and God says my daughter tonight know this I'm opening the door I'm releasing you tonight to do the thing that you thought would never happen it's happening now release it now God in Jesus name amen yeah. hallelujah alright I said we're going to be done tomorrow night Come back, be a part, bring some friends, bring some people. Let's 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 spark revival. Let's create something that can never be stopped. Some of you got a lot of friends. Some of you can just throw out a Facebook message and get a whole bunch of people here. Let's just do it. It's Friday night. There ain't nothing going on around here. I saw some of the names of the restaurants around here. I wouldn't want to go there either. Hallelujah. All right. Amen. Thank you guys. Amen. And don't leave. We do have some flyers that you can take with you um, to pass around. Also, if you um, you don't want to hand them out to people or friends, whatever, we have some flyers in the back. So please take some with you tonight. And that was a powerful word. I don't know about you, but I'm ready to move forward. And we're we're in this together, so we're moving forward together. Amen. So um, I just want to remind you that we're going to take a, a second offering, um, and this is going to our speaker. He's coming from California, so we just want to help with the with the costs, um, with the lights and everything that comes with it. So I just I want you to open your your hearts up and ask the Lord, what would you have me give tonight? And just step out in obedience, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. So let's just pray. Father, we just thank you for your word, Father God. I thank you, Father God, that your word is coming on to good ground, Father God, and that it's going to grow, Lord God, and it's going to produce much, much fruit, Father God, quickly, Lord, that we're going to see this happen, Father God. I just thank you for that even now, Lord. Father God, I just thank you, Father God, for um, Pastor Aaron that you brought him, Father God. He, for this week, Lord God, with a word in due season for this body, Father. I thank you for what you're doing even now, Lord God. And Father God, I just pray that even now, Lord God, that you will put it upon each and every one of our hearts, Lord God, that what you would help us to give, Father God, over and beyond our times, Father God. And Father God, I just thank you, Lord God, that you are faithful, Lord God, that you're going to bless it, Lord God, that it's going to be running over, Lord God, that men will give into our bosom, Lord God, and that we do not lack for no good thing do you withhold from us who walk our 
uprightly, Father God, because our, our righteousness is of yours, Father God. And we just thank you, Lord God, that you are supplying to the full our every need, no matter what it is, Lord God. And Father, we stand in faith knowing that we're going to see you move, Lord God. Father God, we praise you, we magnify you tonight, Lord God, in Jesus' name. So again, just as a reminder, um, you can give online at www.thecitadel.church. You can give, you can text a dollar amount to 84321. You can give um, through the Church Center app, um, download the Church Center app and select the Citadel as the church. And you can give on there as well. And like he's, okay. and if you need a, an envelope, I'm sorry. Um, if you give cash or check, please raise your hand if we need an envelope and our ushers will be more than happy to give you an envelope. Mr. Um, Linda needs an envelope, please. And Robert's going to come around with the offering baskets just so that you can give in, give whatever you would like. Again, please don't leave without getting some um, flyers in the back so that you can invite people tomorrow. Here, same place, same time, 7 p.m. Please invite your coworkers, your friends, your neighbors, your relatives, your family, everybody and anybody. We want to fill this place up. Um, you don't want to miss. You want to be here again tomorrow night. It's going to be powerful. Okay. So let's just pray and close out. Father, we just thank you and we praise you, Lord God, for the powerful word even tonight, Lord God. Father God, I pray that even as we go to go to bed, Lord God, or whatever we're going to do, Lord God, that we will marinate on the word that was spoken tonight, Father God. We thank you, Lord God, for what you're doing, Lord God, in each and every one of us, Lord God. And I just thank you for that, even that increase, Lord God, in every area, Father God, that, Father, we are crossing over, Lord God, that we are no longer going to stay the same, Lord God, that we're we're not satisfied, Lord God, with where we're at, Father. We want more, Lord God. We need more of you, Lord God. Father God, draw us more and more closer to you, Father God. Father God, I just pray that you would just continue, Father God, to minister to each and every one of us, even as we sleep tonight, Lord God, that our sleep will be sweet, Lord God, that you will bless our dreams, Lord God, that we will wake up strengthened and energized, Lord God, and with the ear to hear your Holy Spirit, Lord God. We thank you for what you're doing, what you have done already, Lord God, even tonight, Lord God, and what you're, go what you're going to continue to do tomorrow, Lord God. Father, we love you, we praise you, we thank you for this rain, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God, that it, 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 that it is a prophetic word, Lord God, of the rain that's coming and being poured forth onto the city of Tucson, Father God. We just thank you, Lord God, that your Holy Spirit, Lord God, is being released in a greater way, Lord God, that you are awakening, Father God, the, the people in the city of Tucson, that you're awakening their spirits, Lord God. Now, Father, we just thank you for the abundance of rain now in Jesus' name. Amen.